here in the presence of Merrill Marshall, who's an inspirational um, amateur archaeologist and founder member of NOSAS. NOSAS started in 1993 and will celebrate 25 years uh, in the year after next. Uh, so Merrill um, was the leading light in the Milk Hike um, Adopter Monument Project, together with the avuncular John Womble. And if ever you've met those two, you'll, you'll know what I mean. Um, another part of the Milk Hike Adopter Monument team, um, who knows, is this man? Who knows who this is? OK. Um, it's um, Duncan Forbes of Culloden. Um, this fabulous statue um, is in Parliament Hall, um, which is not a, a Parliament Hall in the centre of Old Town. I had the great privilege of getting into Parliament Hall with Merrill a few years ago because we wanted to see this map. Um, he's a really important part of the team. Um, he was Lord President of the Court of Session. Uh, he was a huge player um, in the events leading up to the 45, um, and in particular the 46. Um, it's um, interesting that uh, it was on his land, he's Duncan Forbes of Culloden, it was on his land that the final battle of the, the rebellion was fought. He's important um, because he, well, he died two years after that. He's important because his father survived um, and fought against the Jacobite Rebellion in 1689. And his son actually developed the Merintosh, the, the uh, Ferintosh distillery. Now, what was important about his father, that because he fought against the 1689 Jacobite Rebellion, um, he was favored as a result of that by um, a license for a distillery which was tax-free. Um, so his father developed it a bit. I'm not sure that Duncan Forbes himself did a lot, um, but his son certainly did. His son was John Forbes, um, married into money in England, so did well for himself, and used that money to hugely develop the distillery on the north side of the Black Heart. So that's the rest of the team. Um, this, the project really st was in two phases. There was an initial phase in 2009 and 10. That was really before my time. And then there was another phase, 2012-13. Um, that's where it is. That's the Black Isle. Um, if you see that in 1750, that's four years after the battle, you'll see this huge... Have I got a point? Yeah. You'll see this huge conurbation room around this area called Ferintosh, on the north side of the Black Isle. If you look at Dingwall, which was an ex-Viking city, but some of the others are the typical sort of Roy, um, small, small tombs. But this is, this is a huge conurbation, and this is about whiskey. This is based on the, the license to make whiskey and not be taxed on it. So that's the rest of the team, um, John, whoops, that's John Rommel, and that's Merrill. And what's lovely for me to see this slide, because I'm really presenting on, on Merrill's behalf, is how young she looks. So maybe this was a 2009 photo. Uh, this is the site that we're talking about. Now, local tradition has it that there was a distillery here. Um, but when Merrill and John and others got involved in this, what they met was wind and gorse on a, uh, on a fairly knobbly site. Quite interesting that that's um, a stone circle, a cairn and a circle. But the area that interested them was here, and this has been partially cleared. So the, the project had three phases. It was recognition and clearing. Let's just get out everything out of the way and see actually what remains of what is thought to be a distillery. Um, the next step.
stage after that was recording and surveying, and the third stage was limited clearing and excavation, and I guess the fourth stage was presentation. Um, so this is them having cleared part of the site, um, and, and those of you who cleared sites like this will recognize the bare patches where huge amounts of gorse have come away. But um, I don't know whether you can see it at the back in this light, but structures are emerging. Down here, here, um, here. There's a big sort of enclosure type structure here. And that um, cairn is up the top here. So this was the first stages of the project. I'm not, because I wasn't involved, Cara, were you involved in this first stage of clearing, or were um, you involved in I the... I think I missed the hard work, actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure at what stage they actually involved a Dr. Monet. I've got a feeling from, from what I've heard that it might have been uh, after this. Anyway, this is, uh, again, those of you who've ever done this sort of thing, it's real hard work, but quite fun if you do it together. Um, lots of bonfires of all the wind. Um, and that's what it looked like when it was cleared. So that's huge, because again, these structures now look much better. That's that big enclosure. Uh, that's an area that we'll see a lot more slides of uh, later. That turned out to be the, um, the kilns. There's no records, no paper records of this at all. So. Um, or, or plans, you know, estate records. So it's really hard for Merrill and the rest of us to know actually what these structures were exactly. So this was, in a way, the second phase. Um, this was a combination of tape and offset and plain tabling. Um, right in the center was a very marshy area with a well, and it's thought of that thought that that well could have been used um, in the production of whiskey. Um, this this area here we're going to see more of. This turned out to be a kiln. There's another kiln there. You can see the rough shape of it. And then we have a number of other buildings to do with the um, the, the whiskey process distilling. Uh, that's quite a lot of words, but what that starts out at, 1689 at the top, that was when Duncan Forbes Senior was given the, the warrant to produce whiskey without tax. Um, his son, the famous Duncan Forbes, was president of the Court of Session, in a, a very significant lawyer who tried very hard to bring the two sides in the Civil War together, in the uh, 45 Rebellion together. Um, and then, I don't know whether you can see the figures, but in 1760, John, the son, uh, married money and really invested in this distillery. And it went up from 41,000 gallons a year in 1763 to 1780 with 123,000 gallons of whiskey. Now, I don't know what that's like compared to a modern distillery, but it seems a lot to me. Uh, so you can imagine the money that came out of that. Um, in 1782, another distillery was built, but in, by 1786, uh, the system had had enough of his free whiskey, um, because all the other local whiskey distillers were unhappy about this, and the privilege was withdrawn. Um, and as a result of that, there's this famous, oh, I, does anyone speak Scots? <laughs> if an Englishman tries to read this, draw, the Ferentish the Ferentosh, so sadly lost, Scotland lament free course to course. Now Colic, Gimp, Grips, and Barkenhust, Mikelasar, for loyal Forbes, chartered boast, is Tarnawa. Um, this is Robbie Burns. So it was obviously well known. Anyone here had heard of Ferentosh whiskey before today? No. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Uh, This is them getting to grips. This is, um, in a way, this looks like an adopter monument um, drawing for me. Because having cleared the site, one of the issues about the site was that it was covered with a whole lot of wind. 
um, and, and gore. So have, and there were cattle freely roaming through the site. So one of the first things that they did on collaboration with the Dr. Monu was to put a big fence around and keep the cattle out. Um, and then, having, then they were able to do a bit more surveying. Um, they produced a booklet, um, which was one of the other um, things that they wanted to liaise with the Dr. Monument about. Um, and again, we've seen that, that picture before. Uh, I think that's a fabulous story. Uh, well done, Meryl, for that. Um, a little more clearing. And this moves into the clearing and I think excavation is too big a word, but it's really just trying to um, remove a lot of the, the rubble and the, uh, the um, insides of, in particular, this kiln. Um, some of you here will know more about whiskey distilling than I do, than the process of whiskey distilling. Um, but part of the process is drying the grain, uh, probably barley, could have been some beer, uh, drying the grain, um, slowly heating it um, in, in kilns. Um, which weren't at, at that stage in the mid 18th century, weren't that far apart from a, a corn drying kiln. Uh, so that's the inside of the kiln in the process of clearing. Um, lovely picture into the middle of the kiln, down, down the length of it. Um, and again, it's, it's a bit small. Um, but a fabulous picture of the drawing uh, of the kiln itself. Quite a big kiln. Um, so in terms of the, the whole project, um, there was local interest, local energy from Merrill, John, and a number of others. Um, there was the, the expertise and the financial help from the Dr. Monument. Um, and what we have now is a, is a site which is protected and preserved. Um, uh, a, a pub, some publicity, a leaflet, um, something on the ground to actually come and look at, um, display boards on site. So um, as we say goodbye to the, the Black Isle, um, just want to say thank you to a Dr. Monument for the help um, and the inspiration that they provided. <laughs>